Hey again, everybody. Welcome back to Mill Creek Church. Thank you once again for tuning in to week two of our five-part sermon series this week as we continue on in our Easter series that we introduced last week that was eerily named The Night Before the Dawn. And it came to my attention this week as I was just studying and preparing for this message that I didn't really explain to you what that meant, though I'm sure some of you probably figured it out when we were talking about the dawn and the resurrection. But in order to get to that point of dawn, where the sun uh, crests against the horizon and begins to share the light of a new morning, you first have to come or bring the night to an end. There's a period of darkness that has to take place before the dawn can have its full effect. Whereas last week we discussed the necessity of the dawn, today we will begin discussing what happened in the night that preceded it. Uh, and this will take place for three weeks before we return back to the dawn in that triumphant uh, resurrection scene that we get there as Jesus rises from the dead. And so last week we began to unpack the necessary force behind the Christian faith that if it were not for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we do here today and every Sunday is irrelevant. In fact, it's morally evil, as we saw last week. Because without the resurrection, there is no unity in the Christian faith. Without the resurrection, all that we do is vain and worthless, as Paul said last week. We are liars living in a dead and futile faith, and we are of all people the most lost and the most to be pitied if there is no resurrection. And so, as we studied last week, we saw the resurrection is fundamental to our faith, and we'll get there in a few weeks' time. But what I have for this, us this morning is by no means an easy sermon to preach. It is dark. The lesson before us this morning is uneasy. It is sorrowful. It is troublesome. It is gut-wrenching, and it's even horrifying. But in order for us to see that glorious daylight that takes place at the dawn, we must first endure the night. So we begin that today in a message that we're calling Prayer in the Night. Prayer in the Night. And to do so, I ask that you would go ahead and turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew. We'll be just two chapters from the end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 26. This is a very easy spot in the scriptures to remember, Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. So we'll pick up our reading at verse number 36. The Word of God says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and told his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, with him and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them, and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went again a second time to pray and prayed again, saying, My father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink from it, your will be done. And again he came back and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. Behold, the one who is betraying me is near. May we pray. Lord, as we approach this first episode in the night, we just ask that you would help us to see exactly what's taking place that you would help us as we walk through this threefold prayer, uh, as you repetitively go and ask the Father's will to be done, but also that this cup, if it be possible, would pass from you. Help us to understand what's in that cup and what it means to pour out our hearts before God completely, openly, unashamedly, as you tell us in your word, to ask and it shall be given, seek, and will find, knock, and it shall be opened unto us. Help us, Lord to see how to be faithful 
and to bear true allegiance to what we do here each and every day as we seek to live out this Christian walk. Help us to see the truths that you have embedded in this text today. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. There is immense sorrow and immense tribulation that is found in these verses this morning. They are deeply emotional. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be able, uh, because of just simply a lack of eloquence, to be able to take you to the depths of anguish and of torment that I experience as I read these words and I see what Jesus is going through as he uh, is telling his disciples and they're refusing to stay awake with him. They're refusing to pray for him. They're refusing to be there for him in his time of need. And, and I just simply lack the words and the wisdom to be able to share with you what is exactly on my heart. But I'm going to endeavor to do the best I can today. And the division in the text before us is, is fairly simple. I don't see a reason to go into more depth or, or tear it apart more so than what's presented for us. Jesus prays three separate times in the Garden of Gethsemane, and so we'll naturally take three divisions as we read through these uh, 10 and 11 verses. At first, we'll say that Jesus was troubled. He was giving a troubled prayer. Secondly, we'll say Jesus was torn. He was giving a torn prayer. And then thirdly, we'll say that he was tortured, and he was giving a tortured prayer as he's pouring out, petitioning himself, to God. But before we get into either of those three categories, we always need to begin with the context. And I know that I harp on it a lot, but we learn so much from the context of the passage before us that it, it gleans so much light into what we're discussing. So what's happening here in chapter number 40, I mean 26? In the immediate context here, Jesus has just celebrated the final Passover with his disciples. It is at this Passover feast that the elements present in the Passover take on a new form, and God, in the form of G or in the person of Jesus, institutes what we now know as the Lord's Supper. Jesus here shares this supper with them in the upper room with the disciples as he predicts his betrayal. Uh, as he's predicting his betrayal, Judas is literally sitting in the same room as all the rest of them. And as Jesus is looking toward the cross, he begins breaking the bread, uh, symbolizing his body that would be broken, partaking the cup, his blood that would be poured out. And he's pointing to himself literally being poured out on the cross because of this one of the twelve that is going to betray him. And as the chapter continues, it just keeps getting darker and darker. Jesus predicts the disciples scattering. And here is where we have that familiar promise to Peter that before the rooster crows, Peter's going to deny him three times. But if you read the passage, it's not just Peter. And I think sometimes we often get caught up in that story because of Peter. But it's not just Peter. Jesus says if you strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. So the context that's presented before us here in the uh, preceding verses is one of suffering. It's one of uh, trouble, it's one of sorrow, it's one of betrayal, it's one of loneliness. And it is in this context where verses 36 through 46 are inserted into this narrative. And all of the events that we're going to discuss today, as well as in the next two weeks, they take place in this period of a single night. This single night from the time the Last Supper is instituted until the time of Jesus' crucifixion, that is what we're going to be discussing over the next few weeks. And so we pick up today in verse number 36, where the text says, Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Now the word then is a transition word. We don't need to harp on that very much. But it does point directly to the text that preceded it which was the disciples going out to the Mount of Olives with Jesus, singing hymns after they had finished this final Passover slash Lord's Supper, which was instituted there, and swore that they would never desert Jesus. So this narrative takes place right on the heels of that. And they go to this place, this garden called Gethsemane, which means oil press in the original language. So this was likely an olive vineyard. Uh, at the base of the Mount of Olives, perhaps even extending up the Mount uh, 
uh, a little ways on the hillside there. And as Jesus leads the way, he tells his disciples to stay back while he goes into the garden or into the vineyard to pray. And this tells us that Jesus was going into prayer alone. This was not a public prayer. This was not like when he taught his disciples to pray. This was an intimate time of communion between the Father and the Son. But more than that, as we'll see momentarily, it will be a prayer that is filled with all types of emotions and anguish and bitterness as Jesus prays. And I want to pause here because too often we think of prayer as either asking God for something for our sake or asking on the behalf of others. But this prayer of Jesus shows us a completely different type of prayer, one of just opening his heart before the Father. This was an agonizing, completely honest, holding nothing back, bold type of prayer. This is the kind of prayer that we ought to pray often. And so now we come to the scene of the first prayer that we talked about. It is that of troubled prayer. If we look at verses 37 and 38, we'll see the text says, And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Now, Jesus leaves the, some of the disciples behind at the entrance to the garden kind of as a barrier so that he could go in uninterrupted, so that they're standing guard in case p the people begin to follow. It is later in the afternoon. They've instituted the Last Supper, but Jesus was drawing crowd upon crowd upon crowd. So he wants to focus solely on prayer. But then he takes with him three of his disciples, Peter, James and John. And you say, why did he do that? And some commentators say, well, this is the inner circle. This is the people that he always took, such as when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. These were the people that were there. And I, I think there's a more basic uh, meaning behind that. I don't think that it was so much to do with the inner circle as it would be, these would be the leaders and teachers of the group. They would be the ones that would be spearheading the ministry once Christ ascends. And so these would be the ones that needed to be the most prepared. And so Jesus is bringing them along with him. But even as he does this, even, even as he brings Peter, James, and John, he tells them to wait behind as he goes in further up the hillside to be more secluded and by himself. Now, as we read these verses, there are a lot of emotions here. Jesus began to be sorrowful, the word here meaning deep sadness in the NASB that we read earlier. He says, my soul is deeply grieved is what this word means. It's more than a simple unhappiness or a time of ill contentment. It is amplified further by the next term that we find in the text, which is troubled. And at the most base sense, this word means to be away from home to be away from home at its most base sense. If you don't elevate it in the Greek at all, at its most base meaning, to be away from home. And I think this is a beautiful word picture here because home for us is where the comfortable things are. It is where you belong. It's where your family is. Home is where you're loved, where you're at ease, where you're accepted, where you're comfortable. And the closest English equivalent that we could get to this word troubled here and the, the rich meaning behind it would be something like depressed. Jesus here is away from home and he's in an utter conflict with hell. Remember here, he's depressed, he's troubled, he's sorrowful about what has already happened, but also about what he knew would happen in the moments that would be coming ahead and the night that would be following. First off, there would be the defection of Judas, the one that everybody trusted. We know that everybody trusted him because he was the one that was allowed to carry the purse for the group. And you don't give the money to the person that you, do, that you least trust. So he was one of the most trusted advisors in the group, one of the most trusted disciples. And that's what makes his betrayal so difficult. Now, this is Jesus, the altogether lovely one, the one who only did right, who only wanted to do right, who loved perfectly and who would give his life for wretched sinners and he would be b betrayed at the hands of a defecting Judas. It's depressing. Then there's this denial of Peter 
and the rest of the disciples. I mean, these are the people that walked with Jesus. They saw the blind receive sight. They saw the lame walk, the sick healed. They even saw the dead raised to life, and yet they turned their back on him. It's depressing. And then there's the injustice of men or the injustice of men. If you think about it, here comes God in human form, walking in the world in which he created. He speaks uh, everything into existence, and then he breathes the breath of life into these people's lungs. And what do they use it for? But to blaspheme him, to cut him down, to swear against him, to shout for his death, to say that they would rather have Barabbas over Jesus. I mean, it's just depressing. And then finally, there's the idea of the future bearing of sin that would come as he would hang there on the cross. And I want you to think about specifically how depressing that is, this sinless, spotless Lamb of God who never committed a sin, but more than that, never wanted to commit a sin, who lived in perfect harmony with the Father's will, who is repulsed at the very thought of sin, becomes sin for you and me. Isn't that what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5? For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The most single-handed, gospel-centered verse in the entirety of the New Testament, perhaps in the entirety of the Scripture, points to this one who is so repulsed by sin and yet becomes sin for your sake, for my sake. It's depressing, it's sad, it's demeaning, it's troublesome, it's sorrowful, it's anguishing, it's agonizing. I mean, I I could just go on and on and on. And this is not fun stuff to preach, but it is truth. And then Jesus even takes it a step further and verbalizes it to his disciples in verse number 38. He says, I'm very sorrowful or deeply grieved even to the point of death. You have to understand here, this is not just some human haphazardly explaining emotion that he's having. This is the Son of God, the one who knows emotions perfectly, for he created them. The one who we read is the way, the truth, and the life. Get this, he is the life. And yet here he says he's so overcome with sorrow, with trouble, that it is literally killing him. He is sorrowful to the point of death. And it is with this troubled spirit that he begins to petition his disciples to stay and watch or to stay awake with him. He's in so much agony that all he wants is for his closest friends and associates to stay awake with him and pray with him and for him and through him. And yet we read in verse 39, and going a little farther, he fell down on his face and prayed, saying, my father, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Again, we find him in this state of anguish and of agony to the point where he is unable to stand. He is prostrating himself before God Almighty, falling flat on his face, petitioning his heart to God the Father. This is God, a very God, bowing down, pouring out his soul to the Father. His prayer here, completely honest, completely transparent. Take this cup if there be any way possible. And so this begs the question, well, what was in the cup? What is in this cup that is so uh, heart aching and and gut-wrenching to Christ? And I would submit to you two things laying heavily on the heart and on the mind of our Lord. Firstly, in that cup is the thought of bearing all sin, of bearing all sin, as we mentioned moments ago. Jesus is looking ahead at the cross, and he feels this immeasurable weight of sin loading upon his back as if you were loading up in a power rack to do a squat or something like that, just loading weight upon weight upon weight upon weight upon his shoulders as as if he is the one who has committed all of these sins. Isaiah writes it like this in Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that all there means that some of those sins laid upon Jesus were yours. Whether they were sins in your childhood, in your youth, your college years, your early adult life, your middle-aged years, your latter years of your life, whatever they are, 
Add all of those up. If you were to take the sins of your life and add those up, I suspect that they would be many. And they were all laid upon the shoulders of Christ. But what if you were to uh, take all of the sins of the person that is, or of a person in your household, or a person in your immediate family, or those here at Mill Creek Church, or in the state where you're watching it, or if you're watching it outside the United States, or from all corners of the globe, just imagine the intense sin, the amount of sin that takes place in the world each and every day. And the thought of bearing that sin made the Son of God stagger in the Garden of Gethsemane to the point of falling down and petitioning God to take this cup from him. And if you think the thought of it was bad, what must the reality have been like when he climbed up the heights of Golgotha and our sins were actually laid on him as he uh, remained there on the cross? But there was more. Secondly, I would submit to you that in that cup was the bearing of the wrath of the Father. There are numerous places in the scripture where the text tells, uh, talks about the cup as referring to the divine judgment of God. One of these brief occurrences that I can just share with you in passing is Isaiah 51, 17. The text says, pull yourself up, pour yourself up, arise. Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, or the cup of his wrath, the chalice of staggering, you have drunk to the dregs. Here the text refers to the cup of his wrath or of his anger. The person that drinks of it can't even stand before God. And the admonition here is, is in the context of almost like a jest or, or of a rhetorical try and pull yourself up, try and arise. But the best that you'll be able to do is to stagger and stammer at the immense weight of his judgments. And he knew the agony of that climb to Golgotha and the bearing and carrying of his cross as he trekked up the mountainside. But here in the garden, we see him not staggering with the physical so much as under the mental and emotional curse that he would bear that following morning. And is it as if it couldn't get any worse in this particular time of trouble for Jesus, when he comes back from prayer, his disciples have fallen asleep. They couldn't even be with him in his time of distress for even a single hour. They were too carnal. They were still too earthly. The Spirit of God in them was willing, but the flesh was weak. And that brings us to the scene of our second prayer, which is that of a torn prayer. You read in verse 42 through 43 again for the second time. He, that is Jesus, went away and prayed, My Father... If this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. Now there's the sense here in which Jesus was torn between two desires. First of all, to let the cup pass if there was any other way. It, unless I drink it, if there be any other way, then I pray that that would be the case. But then secondly, to have God's perfect will accomplished. Your will be done. Constantly we see this echoed throughout the life and ministry of Jesus. He's caught between this emotional and this physical struggle, troubled and sorrowful with loneliness and betrayal all around him, and he had to make a choice. Being human involves making choices, and Jesus was 100% human just like he was 100% God. And all of us as humans have to make decisions, and the same was true of our Lord. Throughout his life, our Lord freely and willingly and joyfully and wonderfully united his will with the will of the Father. We see this throughout uh, the Gospels. In particular, John emphasizes it heavenly in John 4, 5, and 6. But here in the garden, Jesus, is ex experiences, Jesus experiences what it's like to have all the inclinations of his humanity pulling in one direction, while at the same time the will of the Father, the will of his Spirit, is pulling in another direction. And so he is torn. He's literally ripped in multiple directions at the same time. But we see something marvelous here in these verses that I want to reflect on for a moment. My question as I read this was, how in the world was Jesus able to go through with it? Under this intense pressure, this physical, emotional, and spiritual struggle, how could he press on? Look at the words of verse 39. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
Jesus, instead of focusing on his own inclination and on the inclinations of his heart or perhaps even upon his own sinless humanity, he chooses the will of the Father. Now that's striking because as sinless, he could have made the perfect choice. Now, if it were you and I, the decision would be easy because we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so obviously we should trust God above trusting ourselves, but not Jesus. He and the Father are one as we studied in the previous weeks. Never having sinned, he could have made the perfect and the right choice. And that's the teaching. That's exactly what he does here. That's the great truth of these verses. Jesus' spirit here is torn between his fleshly desires and that of the Father's will, but he chooses the latter always. That is the perfect choice. If you're ever struggling and you want to know what in the world you should do, Go to the pages of Scripture, find the will of God, and it is that to which you should always, always, always turn. In this place of desolation and destitution, Jesus, the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God, leans on the Father to make the right choice. That should be a lesson for all of us. But again, we have that glimpse of light as he leans on the Father only for a moment, because guess what? He comes back a second time and finds the disciple sleeping. He comes back from throwing his heart before the Father's mercy seat, and here they are. The next generation of leaders is asleep. The text says their eyes were heavy. In other words, again, we see their flesh was outweighing their spiritual desires. The spirit in them was willing, but their flesh was weak. Disheartened as I imagine Jesus was this time, we're not even told that he attempted to wake them. And then that brings us to the scene of this third prayer, that of tortured prayer. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. That's the same words of verse 39 and of verse number uh, 42, I believe it is. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, or look, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Tortured in his trial and temptation and absolutely abandoned by his closest associates, Jesus here goes again, petitioning God a third time with the same prayerful words. We read in another gospel account that it, it was at this time that his prayers became so fervent that he began sweating blood, an intense picture of Jesus here in the garden. He's putting it all in the Father's hands, hoping his disciples are doing the same. But again, he comes back and they are asleep. He's in agony. He's sorrowful to the point of death. He's got blood, sweat, and tears literally falling down, fainting from his brow. And these are spiritual infants wrapped up in their blankies and in dreamland. It's completely and totally tragic. Like I said, I can't I can't begin to explain to you and express the agony as I read through this, thinking about what Jesus was going through. And so he wakes them up this time and he says, see, or another way to translate it would be look. Remember, he's gone into this uh, garden, which is there on the side of the mountain. Perhaps he's walked into the vineyard. He's elevated himself on a high enough place and turning to his disciples, he comes back, he wakes them up and he says, look behind you. They're able to see out over the uh, valley there and see what's coming. One of the disciples is missing, but the, in, in the distance there comes this band of torches walking their way, the crowd of people closing in on them. And Jesus here senses the intentions of the heart. It says the how, hours at hand and the Son of Man is now betrayed into the hands of sinners, it says in verse 45. After all the praying, all of the agonizing, all of the loneliness at the hands of the disciples, he sees his Father's answer to that prayer. That answer is marching toward him, led by the chief betrayer, Judas. And he says to the disciples, get up, we're going. Interestingly enough, the word here for go or going means to lead. As a military leader would lead his mighty men into battle. Jesus here is agonized for hours in the garden in the middle of the night and sees the Father's response. And instead of fighting that decision that he could have made in his own flesh, he understands it as a call to spiritual arms. And this is just astounding to me that is all after all he's been through, he is willing not only to undertake it, to drink from the cup, but to lead the charge. 
And so that's where we're going to leave off today. Like I said, this is going to be dark. This night before us is dark, agonizing, and excruciating. No doubt about that. This is one of three sermons that is going to be difficult to get through because of the agony here placed on our Lord. But remember what we talked about the last time we were together. All of this is culminating in the dawn of a new morning ushered in by the resurrection. And so I want you to keep your eyes focused here as we conclude today. May we pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us the intense agony, the demeaning demeanor of the disciples as they didn't have faith enough to uh, stand up and to pray and to be willing to lay aside the flesh and instead fulfill their spiritual obligations. But we see the exact opposite in Christ, laying aside the flesh and instead fulfilling the spiritual desires, the will of the Father completed in the Son. And as he sees the betrayer coming with the horde, with the myriads who are coming to take his life, knowing what is to come, he simply accepts the cup that he is to drink from. Pouring out himself to the Father, he says, Your will be done. Lord, help us to pray that prayer and to mean it. As we approach this time of Easter, help us to focus on the dawn, but to get there, help us to understand how excruciating the night was, and in doing so, give us a fuller appreciation for the one that we call Savior. It's in His name that we ask. Amen. Again, thank you for studying with us for another lesson, and until next time, I'll see you then. 